Help for federal workers, local businesses, and nonprofits launch new outreach campaigns for those who aren't getting paid during the shutdown. And thousands of families separated. How the Trump administration's move to split up immigrant families went on for months before facing public backlash. For anybody who doesn't know this area or about this issue, it's very simple. It's one of the biggest environmental disasters that our country suffers. It's been a problem for years, but a solution might be in reach. Environmental experts tell us about the work being done to end cross-border pollution. And a look at how California is better prepared 25 years after the deadly Northridge earthquake. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. It's day 27 of the partial government shutdown and we're seeing more outreach for local federal workers. Near the airport, San Diego Hyatt hotels serve breakfast, lunch and dinner to those who are working without a paycheck. That includes TSA screeners, Coast Guard members, air traffic controllers and customs workers. We wanted to come together and, and really um, show our support for all that they do. And I, I, what, I, what I will tell you is that all of the energy interacting with these individuals today has been positive. Everyone's still um, smiling and it's inspiring to us um, to be able to uh, reach out and support them. Meantime, a South Bay church is also stepping in to help TSA workers. KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman says the church is putting on a weekly food bank in Chula Vista. Milk, bread, meat and vegetables are all part of a food bank put on for TSA workers at the Promise Church in Chula Vista. If we place ourselves in their situation, I know it's not easy for them to ask for food and so we just want to make sure to we show them that we're here for them. We're here for everyone, but they are federal employees that are here you know, providing a service for us citizens of the United States, so we want to give that back to them. The food bank recently benefited more than 60 TSA employees and their families. Cut my cost for food down 95 percent. Ron Gerber has worked for the TSA for 14 years. They were very generous last week. Eggs, uh, bread, lunch meat, uh, frozen meat, uh, desserts. Uh, they, I can't say enough about how they, they've been here. Uh, I've never seen an outpouring like that from a group of people who, and they don't know us. Gerber is one of the thousands of federal workers going without a paycheck. It's the uncertainty that, that really hurts. You, know, you have no idea when the monies are going to start coming in. Gerber says he has a mortgage and credit card bills to pay. He's already had to dip into his savings and does not know how much longer he can work without getting paid. So I can think about, well, do I really want to stay? You know, how long can I hold out? without money, you know, uh, any other job would pay anything and this one doesn't pay anything right now. The church says it will continue to provide food for TSA workers and their families until the government shutdown is over. If anybody, you know, wants to help out, by all means, we do need your support. Uh, like I said, you know, toiletries, diapers, wipes, anything that you can think of. You know, we have very many, many young families in, you know, that have been showing up to the food bank today and yeah, they need, they need our support. In addition to handing out food, the church also gave gas gift cards. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. President Trump says he wants immigrants to go through the proper legal channels, but the government shutdown over the border wall is affecting that process. Right now, courts can only process cases involving detained immigrants. For everyone else, there's an uncertainty over whether they can maintain their legal status. You have people who are, you know, who are trying to do immigration the right way, following the law, trying to get their day in court so they can get a decision to either grant them their status or maintain their status, and they can't get their day in court, which is immensely frustrating because in some cases, eligibility might be at issue if we wait too long. Certain people might age out of being eligible. Certain defenses might no longer be available. And so it, it raises major issues about the administration of justice and just getting due process in your day in court. 
Immigration courts were already dealing with a backlog before the shutdown. Now an additional 20,000 cases per week will be rescheduled until the government reopens. Far more immigrant children were separated from their families than what we saw last spring. An internal report by the Department of Homeland Security says the practice went on for nearly a year before the policy was made public. The report says thousands were separated during that period, but does not give an exact number. All were released before the Trump administration began the zero tolerance policy that led to public backlash and a federal lawsuit. The retired head of the Navy's Pacific Fleet worries about the long-term impact of a government shutdown. He spoke with KPBS military reporter Steve Walsh and also expressed concerns for America's role in the Pacific. Scott Swift says he's lived through other government shutdowns as a naval commander. It disenfranchised all the civilians that worked with me and for me uh, in the Pentagon. Though the Department of Defense is funded through this government shutdown, SWIFT is concerned about the long-term impact on other federal workers. Some workers will learn for the first time that they've been considered non-essential. Others will struggle financially, working without paychecks. Uh, we had people that had been civilians for 40 years, and suddenly we're, we're telling them for the first time the bottom line truth in their mind that they weren't essential. What they were doing was not essential. Some will retire. Younger workers will decide government service is not for them. What we were left with was that middle group was a group of people that felt that they had been disenfranchised. They were good people. They weren't quitters. But it took them a long time to get to a point of trust. Swift was at UC San Diego to give a lecture before the Institute on Global Conflict and Cooperation. He retired last year as the commander for the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Now a fellow at MIT, Swift has toured the Pacific since leaving the Navy. The general view in the region is that uh, the United States has retracted to a level that's counterproductive uh, to the levels of stability that we enjoyed in the region you know, just a year ago. Swift is arguing that the U.S. needs a grand strategy for working in the Pacific, especially since China is reasserting itself in the region. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. San Diego has a new top federal prosecutor. Robert Brewer is now the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of California. He's a Vietnam veteran with decades of experience as a prosecutor and a private practice lawyer. Brewer was nominated by President Trump in June and was recommended by Senators Dianne Feinstein and Kamala Harris. New York might be the next state to legalize marijuana. This week, Governor Andrew Cuomo outlined a plan to decriminalize the drug and use it as an economic engine. Most of the country has legalized marijuana for medical use, but only 10 states have done so for recreational use. And New York has to establish a regulated adult use cannabis program. We had an expert group, State Police Department of Health come together. They did a report. They said the benefits outweigh the risks. Now we just have to put it in place. And we have to do it in a way that creates an economic opportunity for poor communities and people who paid the price, and not for rich corporations who are going to come in to make a buck. Marijuana deliveries will be allowed across California, even in cities and towns where the industry is not allowed to operate. The new rule was announced by the State Bureau of Cannabis Control. It's opposed by some law enforcement groups. Many local governments adopted rules that limit marijuana businesses after voters decided to legalize the drug. Bell companies will ask voters to save their industry. Capital Public Radio's Ben Adler reports on a new referendum that would stop California's plan to end cash bail, the cash bail system. Last year, Governor Jerry Brown and California lawmakers passed a bill to make California the first state in the nation to eliminate cash bail altogether. The law requires courts to base pretrial release decisions on inmates' risks to the public and their flight risks. Backers muscled the measure through over fierce opposition of the bail industry, which could cease to exist. In response, the industry spent millions of dollars gathering signatures for a voter referendum. The Secretary of State's office says the measure is now set for the November 2020 ballot. Whenever a referendum qualifies, the law it targets is put on hold until the election. 
That buys the bail industry nearly two extra years under California's current system and the opportunity to ask voters to overturn the new law. At the state capitol, I'm Ben Adler. Clean water advocates have fought for years to end cross-border pollution. Now KPBS environment reporter Eric Anderson says, says some people think the solution may be within reach. Wild Coast's Paloma Aguirre stands just a few hundred yards north of the U.S.-Mexico border. She's in Goat Canyon. It's one of five places where sewage-tainted water from Mexico flows freely into the United States. It's catastrophic. For anybody who doesn't know this area or about this issue, it's very simple. It's one of the biggest environmental disasters that our country suffers every single year. And now with climate change um, forecasting uh, more intense storm events, we're going to see this problem exacerbated over time. Goat Canyon is actually a success story of sorts. Aguirre is standing beside two large catch basins that keep sediment from swamping wetlands in a nearby state park. Whenever it rains, it's a, it's a canyon, it drains, the Los Laureles Creeks flows across the border and into this area. There's a pollution collector nearby that routes tainted water flow to the International Wastewater Sewage Treatment Plant. That facility was built to help treat cross-border flows during dry weather. Meanwhile, these catch basins keep sediment out of sensitive habitat just a few hundred yards away. One key feature is the small fence that reaches across this basin. These are the only types of trash booms in the entire Tijuana River Valley. They're highly effective, especially for very um, for high floatables. As you can see, there's a lot of plastic bottles. There's a lot of foam. Um, and that is because in Mexico, in the state of Baja California, and in the city of Tijuana, they don't have a formal recycling program. What happens if this barrier is not here and these plastics and the tires and the sediment reach the wetlands that are just over the hill there? I mean, we had a case where um, there was a construction project in Tijuana, so they just cut the, the hillside there. There was no... Uh, plan for sediment control and all of that excess sediment destroyed about uh, I think it was between 30 and 40 acres of wetland and salt marsh habitat so it's incredibly detrimental to the system and obviously plastic input into the ocean marine debris is one of the biggest challenges we will face in the next decade or two we have studies that overwhelmingly um, uh, you know come to consensus that we'll have more plastics in the ocean than fish by 2050. The catch basins and trash booms were put in place by state officials to protect sensitive habitat at Borderfield State Park. And Aguirre says there are lessons here for other locations in the Tijuana River Valley. Just a short distance to the east, the bridge over Dairy Mart Road separates a wide sweeping valley and more rugged river habitat. This sturdy concrete structure was built after flooding washed out the old bridge in the 1990s. This is a point where the river forest or the riparian habitat begins. So a lot of the trash and tires that are carried by the storm flows become trapped in the vegetation. Um, and whatever is not trapped makes its way downstream into the estuary and ultimately into the ocean. On this side of the bridge, the river valley is open, but this bucolic stretch of land changes dramatically when rain drenches the region. The small trickle of a river during dry times can become a raging torrent of swirling pollution. When there's a strong storm event, this can be completely covered in water and the river can be flowing at a rate of a billion gallons of water per day, most of which is completely sewage tainted and, and polluted. Aguirre would like to see some of the lessons from Goat Canyon applied here. She says catch basins could capture wet weather sewage flows, sediment and trash. She says the International Wastewater Plant on this side of the border and Tijuana's sewage system frequently fall short. There's a pump station right at the border that is capturing all of that flow and sending it south from us, preventing that flow from coming across the border. The problem is that pump station breaks down all the time because it gets clogged with sediment, because it gets cl clogged with trash. So. Um, some of those, uh, when that pump station fails and some of those flows um, 
could be captured by these sediment basins. Aguirre says the tainted water that currently fouls the ocean and forces health officials to close South County beaches could be held until it's treated. Federal officials say a lack of funding keeps them from building that infrastructure, but local critics say there is a lack of will. That's why Imperial Beach, Chula Vista, the Port of San Diego, California, and Surfrider San Diego are suing the federal government. They hope the courts compel the International Boundary and Water Commission to stop the cross-border sewage flows that pollute U.S. waters. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. We have that storm system just bringing some heavy rain to parts of Southern California. And looking at a closer view here with the radar, you can see it's heavier when you go north of Oceanside up towards Camp Pendleton and points on northward towards Long Beach. But taking a look at where we do have the flash flood watches and warnings in effect, those are to the north of the area. We will be dealing with the rain during the nighttime hours. Here we are at 6 p.m. So we're still dealing with rain here from Oceanside down towards La Jolla, San Diego, and Chula Vista. As we continue into the nighttime hours, this is around 9.30, still showing some of that chance for rain just south of uh, San Diego into Chula Vista. During the nighttime hours, mostly cloudy night, but we are going to see some of that rain pushing on southward. And by tomorrow morning, it is out of here. We do have a high surf advisory in effect. The surf is going to be building to 8 to 12 feet this afternoon and tonight through Fridays when it's going to be the roughest. We also have some wind advisories in effect until 7 a.m. Friday. Winds will be 30 to 40 miles per hour with gusts of 55 miles per hour with the strongest wind along the ridge tops and the adjacent desert. Tonight, some occasional rain, especially early on, a temperature of 57 degrees in the metro areas, and our temperature for tonight in Ramona is 47. Chula Vista is at 56 degrees, Oceanside at 51, and then for your Friday, things drying out, and we've got some sunshine in the forecast, so sunshine. San Diego, Borrego Springs warms up to 73 for a daytime high, Oceanside's at 64, so along the coast, Plenty of sunshine on the way for Saturday, warming up and mostly sunny for Sunday and Monday. Temperatures in the 60s. Inland areas, mostly sunny for your Friday at 66. It'll be warmer, upper 70s on Saturday with plenty of sunshine and then sunshine for Sunday and Monday. On Friday in the mountain areas, mostly sunny at 52. Plenty of sunshine, 57 on Saturday, warming up to 58 on Sunday. And our temperatures will be in the 70s in the desert areas with plenty of sunshine in the forecast. Back to you. Work that's being done during the winter months to get ready for wildfire season is on hold during the government shutdown. The U.S. Forest Service is among the agencies that are now closed. Federal agencies coordinate on everything from training to controlled burns. Contractors that work with fire agencies also aren't getting paid. Firefighters say the relatively quiet winter months are more crucial than ever as climate change expands the fire season. Today marks 25 years since one of California's worst natural disasters. The Northridge earthquake remains a model for how the state is preparing for the next big quake. KPBS reporter Priya Shreeder takes a look back with one of California's top earthquake scientists. This is what the San Fernando Valley woke up to 25 years ago. On January 17, 1994, at around 4.30 in the morning, a 6.7 magnitude earthquake ripped through the region, collapsing freeways and crushing buildings and hospitals. 57 people lost their lives. 22,000 were displaced from their homes. The damage was estimated at $20 billion. It was an overwhelming event because so many things collapsed. Freeway bridges collapsed, buildings collapsed, and you get these other kinds of twin problems for, you know, all the underground pipes. You know, the uh, gas lines rupture, so there's a fire. You can't put the fires out because the water pipes ruptured. So you get all these build-on, add-on effects that make things all the worse. Dr. Pat Abbott is a geologist who has studied earthquakes and their destruction. He says while the Northridge earthquake was a historic event, lessons have been learned in the aftermath. When an earthquake happens and we have building failures, then the following year they up the building code, they pa pass some state laws, so we try not to repeat the same mistake. California has developed an earthquake early warning system 
that will notify people close to an earthquake when it strikes. Earthquake, earthquake, very strong, shaking, expected in three seconds. Abbott says earthquakes in California are inevitable, and that's why it's important to be prepared. Drop, cover, and hold on. Get yourself protection, ride out the earthquake, and then get out and see where you could help others. He says 25 years later, California is better equipped if disaster strikes. Priya Shreether, KPBS News. Earlier this month, the city of L.A. launched a mobile app that uses the early warning system for magnitude 5 or stronger quakes. Testing will soon begin on a statewide version. The public vote on whether to expand the convention center will wait until 2020. Mayor Kevin Faulkner was considering a special election to be held this year. Now, a spokesperson tells the San Diego Union-Tribune that it will be voted on next year. It's unclear if it will be part of the primary or general election. If passed, the extra tax revenue would also pay for road repairs and homeless services. Encinitas is working on a way to make it easier for homeowners to build granny flats on their property. KPBS North County reporter Allison St. John says the hope is that these units will help meet the city's housing goals. Encinitas has developed permit-ready plans to encourage more residents to build granny flats in their backyards. The city needs to permit more than a thousand new homes to meet state-mandated housing goals, and Mayor Catherine Blakespear says granny flats, or accessory dwelling units, are a way to increase housing density without compromising neighborhood character. It's clearly not going to be the only solution, but I like the solution because of the additional value it gives to landowners, homeowners, and also because it scatters density. So we end up without a major traffic problem on one road. We end up with having one or two additional cars spread out throughout neighborhoods. Blakespear says it's a way for families to deal with younger generations who can't afford to move into a home of their own or older generations who want to downsize. The off-the-shelf plans developed by two local architects could save a homeowner up to $18,000 in permits and fees. There are plans for a studio, a one-bedroom, two-bedroom and three-bedroom units. Owners could not rent them for less than 30 days. Blakespear says she got the idea from a city in Northern California, and as far as she's aware, no other city in San Diego has tried offering these off-the-shelf plans. Allison St. John, KPBS News. I'm Judy Woodruff tonight on the News Hour on day 27 of the shutdown. The tug of war between the White House and Capitol Hill heats up. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. Legendary skateboarder and San Diegan Tony Hawk is taking his talents to Broadway. Hawk will be part of the creative team producing a musical based on the 2007 skateboarding novel Slam. It's expected to open next year. Tony Hawk is a character in the book. He will help produce and choreograph the skateboarding elements that will be part of the Broadway show. A Broadway revival, live chamber music, and a former Last Comic Standing are all on stage this weekend in San Diego. Here with a preview is KPBS arts editor Nina Guerin. Comedian Elisa Schlesinger straddles the line between two generations, Gen X and Millennials. She can joke about things like landlines and stalking your ex on Instagram. I am 35. Because of this, Elisa describes herself as an elder millennial, which is the name of her recent Netflix special and her current tour. Her comedy is a blend of storytelling and nostalgia with a dose of feminism. And if she looks familiar, it could be because Elisa was also the first female and youngest person to win the NBC reality contest Last Comic Standing. There's another powerful lady in San Diego this weekend, Dolly Gallagher Levi from the musical Hello Dolly. Broadway San Diego stages this revival, which starred Bette Midler on Broadway, and now features Betty Buckley as the show's star. The classic musical is about a meddling matchmaker and mistaken identities. It features elaborate costumes and beloved songs like Hello Dolly and Put On Your Sunday Clothes. Of course, Carol Channing, who died earlier this week, played the first Dolly on Broadway back in 1964. Finally, Israel's aerial quartet is on an ambitious endeavor. 
to perform Beethoven's Complete Cycle in honor of the composer's 250th birthday next year. The quartet will perform Beethoven's Cycle Part 1, which includes some of his greatest compositions. From his early years influenced by Mozart to the later complex reflection of his life. The Ariel Quartet formed 20 years ago when the musicians were in middle school and they've evolved into an internationally respected chamber group today. For KPBS Arts, I'm Nina Guerin. Now here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. This weekend will include a special show in the sky. KPBS Morning Edition will have everything you need to know about the blood moon eclipse. And on this week's KPBS Roundtable, we'll talk about the bankruptcy of California's largest utility and its impact on business and public safety. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.